I'm Noah Deitch. Uh, I run an organization called Carbon 180. We're a nonprofit located just across the bay in Oakland, and our mission is to advance carbon removal through science and innovation. And so it's really heartening to see everyone here in this room today not just talking about the problems and the solutions, but how we actually achieve them. And what I would love to share with everyone today is what we believe at carbon removal, which is that it's not just unicorns we're talking about, those whimsical creatures suited for billion dollar phone apps that are sticky for our attention. We need something several orders of magnitude larger. I just randomly selected this other magical creature. So it's a griffin, lion and eagle, right? This is the scale of the carbon removal startup opportunity if we take advantage of it. It might sound a little magical on its face, but what I would like to bring everyone on a journey today is that this is not just something that's plausible and realistic, but something that's absolutely essential if we're gonna avoid all of the challenges that John brought up and actually meet some of our climate goals. That's what our organization at Carbon 180 is all about. We're a new type of nonprofit, and we believe that we can create an economy that sequesters more carbon than it emits. On its face, that might not sound like a radical statement, but everything that we've thought about when it comes to climate change is how do we reduce emissions? That's simply our layover on our way to an economy that's actually net negative and sequestering carbon. And when we started in this space a few years ago, that vision was something that was largely fringe. And I think what this room is showing is that that, that vision is now what mainstream climate change action is all about. Actually building that carbon negative economy is a whole other question though. It requires a massive series of transformations. And I think the iPhone is actually an interesting model for us to think about. When I think about an iPhone, to me, Steve Jobs comes up, brilliant innovators, commercializing products that people really want. But if you think about what went into this phone, it's not just a brilliant design. It was decades of publicly funded research. Steve Jobs did not invent the GPS, the internet, the accelerometer, all of these components. What we don't have today are all of the components that we're gonna need for our carbon negative economy. We have to go out and build them. Challenge is, we had the Cold War and big defense budgets working on innovation back in the day. With government not stepping up to the plate to the extent that it has in the past, how can the private sector think beyond just the, the shiny object at the end and really the tip of the iceberg, but think about how we can build all of those foundational innovations that will be components to our, our carbon negative future? This is how we think about it at Carbon 180. We know that we need lots more research, we need business innovation, and we need policy change. And we see it as an economy-wide opportunity, as well as a, a challenge. What we've seen in, in surveying the, the literature on this topic is that there's a full portfolio of solutions capable of taking carbon out of the atmosphere, all having pros and cons. On the nature-based side, there's huge opportunities in the forestry and agriculture sector to get started on today. Planting more trees and managing our forests in more effective ways can pull billions of tons of carbon out of the atmosphere. Same thing when we grow our food, our fiber, and even our fuel. If we're able to adopt agricultural practices that put carbon back in the soil, this is everything from planting cover crops, restoring riparian areas along rivers, and even thinking about advanced techniques for modifying plants so that they have really deep roots. All of these can build up soil carbon, and there's three times as much carbon locked in our soils than is in our atmosphere. It's a huge reservoir. If we can slowly start to build that up, it can be our first line of defense in this carbon removal challenge. On a related side, we can also begin to build technologies that don't rely on photosynthesis but do something in an engineered way that's quite similar to it. Scientists have thought about ideas on the bioenergy with carbon capture side. They've invented machines that essentially filter carbon directly out of the, the air. These are direct air capture technologies. And even more at technologies further in the, the research pipeline for grinding up rocks and figuring out how to turn CO2 in the air back directly into stone. 
this is really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what is possible in carbon removal. We've only begun to start to envision what could happen today. But even these solutions have enormous scale potential. The National Academies just wrapped up a, a three-year-long assessment of all of the carbon removal approaches and found that there's enormous potential to deploy land-based solutions today and that with technology innovation, we're likely able to bring down the costs of many of these innovative industrial solutions to actually meet the total scale needs. Before I go into exactly what those scale needs are, I think it's important that we disambiguate a handful of terms about what we talk about when we talk about carbon removal. Most importantly, carbon removal is not a technology. There is no such thing as a carbon removal technology. Carbon removal is a system that involves many component technologies. For example, direct air capture machines are often thought of as the kind of classic carbon removal technology. But in fact, you can use a direct air capture machine for reducing emissions by creating synthetic fuels. Or you can use that same technology to create negative emissions. That's why it's really important to think about the entire system of carbon removal in such an integrated way, especially as we think about entrepreneurship in this space that the stepping stones to getting to a carbon removal economy can go through applications and systems that are not necessarily carbon removing in and of itself. And this is where we see the greatest promise for carbon removal entrepreneurship today. We see opportunities for taking those first steps towards a carbon negative economy by figuring out how to change the paradigm on CO2. As John mentioned earlier, CO2 is a, a pollutant when it's in the atmosphere in too high of a concentration. But if we're able to pull that CO2 out using clean energy, we can harness that to turn it back into value. We can take a pollutant and turn it back into a valuable addition to our economy. That not only lets us get started on economically viable opportunities, but it helps us bring down technology costs for the future. I think one of the areas where we see this most clearly is in the carbon capture and storage space. This is another area that is incredibly confusing and has many different conceptions. And there are lots of different combinations of permutations when it comes to carbon capture. What we're seeing when entrepreneurs are, are tackling this space and really succeeding, and we're gonna hear about uh, a few later today, is thinking about this waste to value paradigm. What we're not seeing is the carbon capture 1.0 world of there will be a big carbon tax at some point in the future, this regulation is coming, and thus we must build enormous projects for it. Instead, it's all about finding those commercialization stepping stones to get to scale. And that scale is no joke. It's very difficult for me to envision what a billion tons of anything is. We put nearly 40 billion tons of CO2, not any of those other greenhouse gases, just CO2 in the atmosphere every year. If you compare that volume of stuff to the rest of the economy, it just dwarfs all of the other major commodities that are out there. Not only do we have to eliminate all of these emissions, but we also have to figure out how to build businesses that are gonna sequester tens of gigatons of carbon. Not as many little CO2 bubbles as is up there today, but still on the order of magnitude of many of our commodity industries today. The good news is that there's a huge potential for turning carbon back into value. Our team at Carbon 180 took a look at all of the markets that if you could replace them with CO2 from the atmosphere or from a waste carbon source, what would it actually look like? How do those numbers stack up? And the answer is in trillions globally. Some of those biggest markets are in fuels, cements and aggregates, other building materials. But it's not limited to just a handful of sectors. We can make the clothes we wear out of carbon from the air, the food we eat. There are opportunities economy-wide, and this means there are opportunities for entrepreneurs across that spectrum. This also isn't an imaginary market today. It's actually real. If you want to sell CO2, there is a customer. This market isn't very large, and it's dominated by I, an unconventional customer, if you will, which is the oil industry. 
Today, they buy millions of tons of CO2 to put underground to produce more oil. Other industries at a smaller scale are buying still significant volumes of CO2, but nowhere near what we actually need to get to. So the question is, how do we get from where we are today with these existing markets for, for carbon and bring it to the scale and realize that potential in the future? This is a graph from our, our friends at, at UC Berkeley showing how energy technology costs come down over time. Log scales, which are, again, a little challenging to look at. But every single technology, except for our, our poor nuclear friends, have come down steadily over deployment. This is a function of investing lots of money in research and innovation, but also creating market pull to bring technologies to scale. In every one of these scenarios, the key was not just inventing a technology and hoping it would work, but actually creating that early market for it and finding opportunities where there were customers, where there was political will to change policy and create new markets. And we have to do the exact same thing when it comes to the carbon removal world. The good thing is a lot of things are different today that make this possible, that make those cost curves on the last slide something that I think are, are realistic for many of the carbon removal technologies. First, renewable energy is cheap. It's getting way cheaper. Those lines don't stop there, they keep going down. What happens when we get lots of cheap renewable energy is we're gonna use more of it, which is a good thing. We're also figuring out how to make components of fuel, i.e. hydrogen, much more cheaply than we ever thought possible using that clean energy. Carbon capture is also much more competitive than we thought it would be. Companies today are able to capture carbon from 30 to about $150 a ton off of a point source. Within that range, you're likely able to capture between five and probably 80% of the point source emissions in the United States today. Direct air capture too is one of the technologies that experts now estimate is much more competitive than we ever thought. Back in the day, there were lots of studies that said $600 a ton at best. First of a kind projects are already at that cost today. And there are now lots of studies that show that this over time, and not actually that much time, can get down into the $100 a ton and potentially below range. Lastly, there's a wealth of innovation happening here that's related to carbon. We're just not thinking about it in that way today. How do we take big data and all of the, the analytics that's happening and apply that to developing new carbon capture solutions? How do we figure out how to manufacture and prototype more quickly and more effectively so we can test and deploy in a more economically profitable way? How can we think about biotech and all of the advances happening in CRISPR and some of the other innovative technologies to figure out how we can get plants to grow faster, more efficiently, with deeper roots? All of these things are possible here. And with this confluence of factors, I think amazing things are possible for entrepreneurs today. This is one of the technologies that people thought was basically impossible 10 years ago. Now, there are three companies with full-size pilots around the world actually developing these technologies in ways that many people thought was, quite frankly, not possible. In many ways, this field is like the solar industry of 30 years ago. The technologies vary widely. We have some folks that are figuring out how to capture carbon using liquid processes, some using solid Velcro-like processes, and we haven't converged yet on what that end technology will really look like. Companies are also taking different approaches to market. Some are trying to just build the cheapest, easiest possible technology off the shelf to make sure that there's not engineering challenges. Others are developing incredibly innovative designs and capture materials others in the capture systems themselves. They're also exploring a wide range of different first markets, everything from growing tomatoes and cucumbers in greenhouses to producing fuels using synthetic CO2 and, and hydrogen. All of this shows that we're not at the stage where we've converged and have gotten to the place where we can scale. There's still an amazing amount of opportunity left to figure out what the eventual giants in this space will look like. But what has started to show up is the capital. That if we held this event three years ago, this slide would have been not blank, 
but it certainly would not have had this much color on it. And I think the really exciting piece of this is it's not just giant corporate strategics sprinkling money to hedge their bets in the long run. There's technology investors that don't come from that conventional heavy industry at the table as well. Again, billions of dollars of assets under management just in this room. It's, it's really amazing. But it begs one of the last unanswered questions in this space, which is how do you actually get to scale? Every one of those companies that I showed before has taken large amounts of strategic investment. So has one company doing really innovative work to take CO2 to harden concrete, Solidia Technologies. If you look at some of these investors here, it's a good chunk of the global economy represented in all of these big, enormous companies that have given them strategic investment. Compare that to a company like Tesla, which has gone a complete opposite route and has challenged many of those incumbents through their own innovation. The Tesla equivalent in the carbon removal space has not become apparent yet, but doesn't mean it's not possible. I'd also like to conclude by showing that this is not just an investment opportunity today, and there's lots of ways that entrepreneurs can be creative at getting to scale. The US government, for the first time, is funding carbon removal innovation at a major scale. Other countries and even states around the world are thinking about this as well. Tax credits, the same that encouraged wind and solar to get to scale here in the US, now exist for carbon capture. The low carbon fuel standard, right here in California, Last time I looked was $180 a ton CO2 prices. Direct air capture is one of the solutions eligible for that. Our voluntary carbon markets are still a bit lagging in terms of the, the pricing, but there's lots of ways that we can put together innovative business streams using what's out there in the market as well as the existing policy incentives that investors are willing to, to put their money behind. And lastly, we're really excited to be part of this growing economy as well. We are launching a accelerator program ourselves for early stage technology entrepreneurs, Carbon Tech Labs. Our vision is bringing innovation from lab to market across this carbon to value chain and figuring out how we can get early non-dilutive capital to entrepreneurs, help them connect to the right resources and eventual capital to get them to scale. So I'll, I'll leave everyone with a plug here Send us your, your brightest and your, your best entrepreneurs our way, and we'll hopefully help them get to scale. But thanks to everyone, and I'm very excited to continue the conversation the rest of today.